Well, I never really thought about it as a kid. I mean, I was raised by a single parent mom along with my sister in Ferndale, Michigan. Uh, but it was, it was interesting, what, you know, I don't want to make it a sob story. All my relatives are college graduates. My grandparents were college graduates. They were social activists, community activists. My grandmother was the first female president of a Grange in Ohio. So I grew up with a mother who was active in the American Association University of Women, active in our church. One of the things our church did at Christmas time was to have you fill out a form where you pledge a gift of service, not a present for your family, a gift of service. It could be you promise to mow the lawn all summer, or it could be you're gonna go help at the YMCA or some community organization. So I, I'm from a family of activists uh, who believe in service, believe in public service, but also private service. It's interesting, my mother and all of her friends, you know, again, we, we had a lot of friends and neighbors that were very helpful to me, teachers, others, counselors. All were very interested in politics. Uh, not, not, none of them had ever run for office, but they were very interested in public service. My mother was a great admirer of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and so she was always uh, thinking about the poor, about people who were less fortunate. Um, we never thought of ourselves as <laughs> less fortunate, even though, I'm thinking now growing up without a father, it was different, and especially in the 50s where that you didn't hear much about that. But it was just, uh, they valued public service, but also community service, both. Uh, so I was raised in a household, though, where you know going into public service would be something that was very much admired and respected. You don't hear that much today, unfortunately. It's interesting, though, the millennials, the, the young generation, the kids born between 1982, 2002, they are very much into community service and community action, even if they're turned off by politics. So in one sense, that's a very good development. In another, it isn't. But it's still, you get something positive out of this new generation, this young generation. What concerned me when I became governor, uh, which was January 1st, 1983, was we had 17% unemployment in Michigan. We had the lowest credit rating in the nation. We were tied with Puerto Rico for the lowest credit rating. And youth unemployment was, you know, 25 or 30%. In the cities, probably 50%. So one of the things I thought of doing, and I modeled it after Franklin Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps, was we created the Michigan Youth Corps. And we put to work that summer 25,000 young people in basically community service. They picked up litter along the roadsides, they worked in state parks, they worked in county fairs, they worked in, in um, uh, uh, retirement homes, different places, nursing homes. So it was all really service, and they were paid minimum wage, although we had supervisors that were paid a little bit more than that. Um, and part of the program also was, because for a lot of them it was their first job, was teaching them how to do a resume. We had counseling, so they could use this as a springboard to another job the following summer or a real world job if they were not in school. Of course, we encouraged them to finish school as well or go on to higher education. I'm not as intricately familiar with all the different programs today, although I'm still involved in public service myself and mostly behind the scenes. Um, but what was interesting in 1983 in June and May was that we had a lot of people say, oh, those young people, they don't want to do it. They don't want to work. They're, they're lazy. They don't care. They're not going to do it. Uh, we had others say, well, this program needs to be specially tailored for the very, very poor. I said, no, no, no. We want it for everyone. If this program has a badge of inferiority attached to it, no one's going to want to serve. I want it for everybody. I want it for kids from well-to-do families as well as very, very poor families. So what was interesting was they said it can't work. It won't be done. I said, it has to be done. So we had slots for 25,000 kids. 67,000 young people applied. We were heartbroken that we couldn't take care of all of them. It's true, years later, we didn't need it as much because the economy was doing well. There were jobs available for young people. But I hated to have a whole generation uh, idle in the summer between school years, whether it was high school or college. Well, it was really interesting, and I give Dottie Johnson a lot of credit. 
uh, and her colleagues, uh, other uh, people interested in foundations. But they made me clearly aware early in my tenure as governor that Michigan had a unique position in philanthropy, that we had a lot of really significant foundations as well as local community foundations, that we were a state with, with a big time foundation activities. And it wasn't just Kellogg or Mott or, or uh, uh, Kresge, for example, which were well known. It was a lot of others. And that I thought of, to myself, we can help leverage their activity to help build a better Michigan, a better quality of life. It can't all be done by government. Our resources, as everybody knows, are limited. So if you're the governor of the state, a great state like Michigan, a mega state, if you can leverage their activity and help them, encourage them, this is a really good thing. But the idea really came from, I think, the Michigan Council of the Foundations and, and their allies, the nonprofits, et cetera. They came up with the idea, and we simply grabbed it because I thought it was a no-brainer. And my staff was all supportive, Rick Cole, Bill Liebold, all of them. It's a no-brainer. I don't recall it was a hard lift, but I must tell you it was, you know, it was now many years ago. I don't. I think it was just trying to get people's attention to it. But anytime you're dealing with a tax credit or a tax deduction, it's not easy because then they say, well, I want it for this. I want it for that. If you're going to do this, I want, you know, I want it for my pet project. Uh, so, but we had to convince people that this was in the, in the, in the, state's interest. It was in the interest of our entire state. It's really in the national interest. And yet something about the United States that is unique, that is the, the charitable, nonprofit, activist sector of our society is something we've had for a couple of centuries. I mean, Alex de Tocqueville talked about it in his book on democracy in America. And that's different than most countries. You see it more um, in the cultural areas, for example, I'm, a, I'm vice chairman of the National Archives Foundation. And I see it in Washington, the diplomatic area. I'm, I'm actually past chair of the Meridian International Center, which is a leading public diplomacy center. But both of these organizations complement things that could often could have been government functions, but there's only limited government resources. Uh, and I think that's true across the board. There's so much that could be done to improve the lives of people through foundations, through community uh, foundations. Uh, and they all have, as you know, they all have certain mandates with their charters that they try to follow. Some are dealing with infrastructure, hard stuff. Some deal with soft, soft power. But they all have a role. And uh, I think, and it also gives people a chance to participate uh, in their own time. Again, it's more than money, as you know, and all of you know. It's also time and interest and support, encouragement. And the nice thing about foundations, nonprofits, charitable work, community work, is that people end up feeling like they get more out of it than perhaps the people they help. You've, it makes you feel better about yourself and your world. If you're able to do things because you want to do them, because you think they're important, <clears throat> that you're not forced to do them, or you're not paid to do them. It just makes people feel really good about life. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm a proud Spartan. I uh, have two degrees from Michigan State. Uh, was active in student government there. Uh, you know, and so I feel like I got my political start there running as class president. Uh, I'm a big, of course, Spartan booster of football and basketball. And, and actually, we had endowed scholarships in football and basketball. And I started thinking, gee, before I leave the scene, I ought to do something on the academic side and, and, and do something to encourage young people to go into public service. So it was more than just a major gift, which it is. It is also, it allows me to be involved. So I put my time in it too, in terms of working with the Department of Social Science and the Political Science Department and the Economics Department, History Department, uh, and working with students and with their professors and teachers. So it's, it's the money, yes, that brings in well-known speakers to, to try to inspire people into service, public service, but it can also be private service. Our very first speaker was President Bill Clinton, and he talked as much about private sector community service as he did running for office. I thought that was interesting. 
And that was his idea, it really wasn't mine. Um, but yeah, we want to inspire young people to go into service however they, however they do it so they can build a better world and we want them to know they're needed, they're needed. Um, and so it's, it's, it's yes, the major investment I'm making, but it's also my time and Janet's time. Well, just to encourage service. I dreamed that up. I loved it. I dreamed it up. It wasn't the university's idea. I just thought it was a, it just sounded great. And we, you know, we have a, like an Oscar-like award and it's just fun. And it just makes me feel so good. I don't know what else to tell you other than it's, it hopefully will, and we, by the way, we have, we, we're, we're giving it this year is going to be Ken Burns. So we're not, it's not just people who've held elected office or a point of political office. Because, yes, we'll include diplomats and governors and presidents, but journalists. So you'd be interested in that. Uh, and Ken is a filmmaker and a historian, so that's going to be uh, really interesting. And we want to make it fun for everybody, too. Inspiring and fun. No, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I think Michigan has always been noted for having a, a great deal of uh, philanthropic activities a lot of significant foundations, and a lot of encouragement. I, I would say also that one of my predecessors who became a friend, in fact, Janet worked with him, George Romney, was really into volunteerism. Part of that was part of his faith, which we also find in the west side of our state. And, and actually, well, to, every, every faith has a different way of wanting service. But as you know, there was an emphasis on service through George's Mormon upbringing. Um, and, and really a de-emphasis on government doing things, although I must say George Romney gave us our modern constitution, which I appreciated because I was a benefit of it. It gave a lot of power to the governor. So it was always nice to follow a guy that knew how to run things. But uh, we've had people like that. You mentioned Ra uh, Russ Mobby, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's others uh, uh, at the Mott Foundation that I work with, and of course Dottie, and that whole crew. She brought a whole crew in to meet with me on this issue of of giving and how to encourage it. And we, we've just, I think, been a major uh, a state that leads in that area. Has led, leads, will lead in the future. Well, I think there's a bond between people who've had the same office, a very high privilege, challenge, and honor. And there's a bond that connects people, absolutely. And I think you find that with presidents as well. You notice uh, President Bill Clinton has traveled to, over to uh, Southeast Asia after a, a tsunami with President H.W. Bush. Later, he was in Haiti with President George, George W. Bush. And we, we collaborate here as well. Uh, and I have worked with, with Governor Milliken and uh, Governor Engler on different things, including our connections to Canada, yes, which are very important. The new Gordie Howe Bridge, a big deal, important for all of Michigan, not just the Detroit area. Yeah, well, there's there are many. I, I'd hate to list a group because there's so many I would leave out because there are. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly Russ Mobby and Bill White. Yes, and others uh, at the Kresge Foundation, for example. Um, uh, several in Detroit, but um, I don't know who the leaders are now. But uh, it's, it's, it's a really active group. Well, John Lohr, you know, of course. Uh, the thing about, uh, about philanthropic leaders is they generally, they, they play a little bit on the guilt people have for not doing enough for their fellow human beings, but they make it easy for you. They're leaders, they lead by example. They make you feel good when you do something to help, whether it's contribute, uh, financial resources or time or ideas or influence like lobbying for things they make you feel good uh, and they try to stay a little bit in the background so that the people that are they recruit to help you get some recognition as they're going about their service and I think that's that's the other thing it reminds me of what <laughs> former the late former senator Pat Moynihan once said about Washington uh, and I think it could apply to philanthropic leaders, which is, he, he, Pat Moynihan said, Washington is a city where a person of great ability and goodwill can accomplish an enormous amount, provided they're willing to let others get the credit. That could be said 
of our philanthropic leaders in Michigan.